Thank you, uh, everyone, for staying for this lovely uh, dance music. Um, we're actually having a, a session on financial inclusion. Uh, so if I could ask the, the panel to come up, uh, please. Koswahi uh, Iahen, please. Uh, thank you, Koswahi. Uh, Anna Liniana Vega Trejo. Uh, Arif Khan. Sasha Vesnik. And uh, Sony Kapoor, please come up to the panel. Thank you all for coming here uh, for this session, uh, focusing on making finance and insurance inclusive. Um, I think we all know that the Sustainable Development Goals are an integrated uh, set. Uh, we can't achieve environmental progress without social progress. We can't achieve economic progress without social and environmental progress. We have to think about these as an integrated whole. Uh, in inclusion, financial inclusion, is at the heart of the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals, obviously uh, around poverty, but in many others as well. Uh, but also, I think, as well as in sort of broadening access to core services around credit, around savings, around s insurance, we also ne need to think about how the whole financial system, in terms of core banking, in terms of core investment, in terms of core insurance, is also supporting a more uh, inclusive uh, economy. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, the context. Uh, particularly, what I'd like to bring out of the panel is, is how we're making progress on actually uh, access to uh, financial products across the banking, investment, and insurance uh, world. What is still uh, to be done? Uh, there's a lot still to be done. There's a lot we can be very pleased with. Uh, and also how uh, financial inclusion does enable us to achieve uh, many of the other uh, objectives and priorities we've been discussing here in Paris, issues around the circular economy, uh, around climate change, around uh, water efficiency. Many of you might have heard that there is now a, a term that is, that is starting to get traction in the financial community around a just transition how we make progress on climate change, but the green economy more generally, how does that include questions of social injustice uh, and builds a, an inclusive economy? So that's our agenda uh, for the next hour, taking us through uh, to one o'clock. Uh, and to help us really unpack these questions, we've got a, a great uh, panel. Uh, we have Ekoswahi Iahen, who's the newly appointed Secretary General of the Insurance Development Forum. Welcome. Um, Ala Ledian Vega Trejo, who is president of the Banco de Fomento Agropecuria. Thank you so much. Uh, Arif Khan, CEO of IDLC Finance from Bangladesh, on the far, far right there. Uh, Sasha Beslik, head of Group Sustainable Finance in Nordea. Sasha, welcome. Uh, and Sony Kapoor, who is the CEO of uh, Redefine, a financial think tank. Uh, and he's not Amy Clark. Um, doesn't look a bit like her. Wait till the end of the session. Right there. there might be a wig involved, um, but this is the, the panel, and thank you so much, Sonny, for, for joining. So what we'd like to do is actually just lay out the scene, uh, understand uh, some of the priorities, understand where we're making progress. So I'd like to turn to you first, Ikoswe, if I may, uh, from the Assurance Development Forum, really trying to inc inc close this uh, protection gap we know is so, so important in developing countries. Where do you see the landscape lies at the moment? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, you're, you're, you're right. Um, when we talk about the protection gap, um, I saw a recent report which was launched by Lloyd's, which identified $163 billion in terms of um, protection gap currently existing, and 96% of that being within um, emerging economies. Um, so the IDF, which is the Insurance Development Forum, was really born out of a recognition within um, the United Nations, um, within the industry as well, and also with the development financial institutions, the World Bank, to say how can we do a lot more in terms of deepening the insurance markets to support resilience efforts. The fact is that when we look around, um, when we look um, across the world in emerging economies, you have these disasters occurring, significant impact on people, businesses, governments, etc. And there is an urgent need within those constituencies to actually find solutions, innovative financial tools to help them deal with these issues. Um, and so the IDF was launched in Paris, COP21, 
Um, and it came out of deliberations at the political champions for disaster risk management um, um, discussions about a public-private initiative where you could deploy the skills, expertise, um, capacities within the industry through a singular vehicle to engage on this issue of addressing the protection gap. Um, so within IDF, it's, um, you have representatives from the major insurance companies. Yesterday, you heard from Denny Duverne, who is the chairman of AXA and also the chair of the IDF. Um, but he's supported by um, Joaquin Levy from the World Bank and also Akim Steiner from UNDP. Because we see this as an issue that is not one that can be addressed by a singular sector or institution. It's something that must be um, addressed by a multiplicity of um, entities. Um, and so through the Insurance Development Forum, we focus on five areas where we think we can make real um, changes in terms of addressing the protection gap. The first is on risk modeling. When we look at emerging economies again, the, uh, the, the quality of the models that we have there that build and help us to understand what the risks are within these contexts need to be improved. And there is a need for concerted effort and focus on that and to also open up these models so that they're accessible. So that's one focus area. The second area is on sovereign humanitarian solutions, which is we have lots of governments, institutions, which say, okay, every year I'm battered by a hurricane or whatever the case might be, or I face huge exposures, be it maybe in cocoa or, what, or, or some other agricultural um, sector, and I need to find some kind of solutions. And so through IDF, we can engage with governments, with humanitarian institutions to say, how can we tailor solutions that might be appropriate for your needs? Um, the third area of focus for us is on regulation laws and resilience policies. Um, if we are going to be engaging on these issues, new product development, financial mechanisms, how do we engage regulators to understand what it is and to understand this landscape and to accompany and facilitate this, um, this emergence? But at the same time, when we talk about emerging economies, there's huge amounts of innovation that's going on. We look at Kenya and Pesa and the rollout of that product in that country. And it's not only in Kenya, it's many places across the globe. So what are the opportunities for harnessing technology um, to help us deploy some of these financial instruments and create a more inclusive um, community uh, um, and society that, um, for, for all of us? Um, obviously, the other, my, the other group that we have is microinsurance. Um, one of the challenges with microinsurance is getting to scale. Um, there are lots of pilots. How can we address some of the deeper structural issues that impede the ability to scale up these mechanisms to the level that they need to be operating at, given the challenges that we are faced with? Um, and then finally, looking at investments. What are the opportunities to actually deploy some of the resources that we have within the sector to support investment in resilience infrastructure? So those for us are the target areas, is to engage within the insurance industry, within our development partners who are actively engaged in this space to come up with solutions because we just don't have the time <laughs> um, to, to, to wait for, 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 for that anymore. We have to act. Thank you, Koswe. But also, I think what is interesting about the insurance sector is actually there are some working examples out there. I think you were talking earlier about work that's been going on in Africa and the Caribbean. Maybe a couple of thoughts on that. Okay, yes. Um, yes, there, we are seeing a, um, an increasing emergence of innovation around new kinds of um, insurance um, instruments and tools. And so I'll talk about um, the first one, which is the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, um, which was launched in 2007 through collaboration between the World Bank, CARICOM and Caribbean countries to create um, an insurance fund using the weather index parametric tool to trigger resources to support immediate response to a disaster once it, it has occurred. Um, to date, that facility has paid out over $130 million within two weeks of an event occurring to those affected governments. That's significant. Um, it's significant not only in terms of the injection of liquidity to support in interventions, um, but it's also about what it has catalyzed in terms of understanding risk and beyond insurance, some of the measures that governments people, communities, businesses should also be looking to invest in to support greater resilience. Um, in the context of Africa, which also came from the learning that was done in the Caribbean and other regions, um, it was again a structuring of a similar kind of continental risk pool, initially focused on drought, also weather index based too. But the innovation with this mechanism was about how can we link the insurance payout 
to specific response activities, to the scale up, say, of social safety net systems, a cash transfer program, a school feeding program, or something like that. And it was quite innovative because it was really, I think, the first time where you had that kind of direct connection between um, an insurance payout and impact on the ground, and also enhancing accountability, transparency, um, as it relates to impact. I think the last session was about impact. Um, and again, it's, we have to, it's not only about developing new tools, instruments, but actually making sure that they address the issues um, which we have to contend with and the people who need these instruments and these um, support as much as possible. So real cash at the right time and behavior change. Yes. Yeah, very good. So Anna Linian, uh, we've already heard a mention of microinsurance and I believe your, your bank is uh, developing a pilot program here. I mean, it'd be very interesting to hear about that and particularly I think following on uh, from Akoswe, this, this question of how we scale up some of these exciting initiatives so that we really bring those to the broader market. So over to you. Well, thank you very much for being here. I am so proud to be here, but my English is a little poor. I need to speak in Spanish. I don't know if someone can help me to translate my, my speech. Do we, uh, in the audience, we need not a doctor, but a <coughs> Spanish speaker. Do we have a yeah. Spanish speaker in the room? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's Spanish. Close. <laughs> Spanish, please, please, please. Um, Matias, if, you, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, my and, and English is so bad. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you for, for, as an Englishman, making the point that we're in a very Anglophone environment. So, uh, thank you. So I think a round of applause for our new uh, interpreter. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, bueno, eh, uh, hablar en español. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no en español. Bueno, sí, estamos llevando un, una prueba piloto de los microseguros paramétricos en mi país. Eh, en El Salvador la penetración financiera es muy baja, 17%. Uh, well, I'm not a professional, so I apologize. I thought she was Portuguese, that, uh, that what I was saying, I also speak Portuguese, but it's fine. She's from El Salvador, so it's much better. <laughs> She's saying that in El Salvador, the banking penetration is very low, it's 17%. And in insurance, it's even lower, it's just 6%. En los microseguros paramétricos no existían hasta la prueba piloto que nosotros estamos llevando a cabo. Uh, Microinsurance was not even a reality until the pilot uh, initiative that they are launching now. Esto obviamente nos dio algunos problemas a la hora de poder lograr contar con una póliza de seguro. Mm -hmm. Porque los, los reguladores y los supervisores no conocían sobre este tema y tuvimos que llevar un, un proyecto con, que to, nos tomó dos años. Mm -hmm. eh, lograr que, el, que tanto los reguladores como los supervisores entendieran. Yes, so they, they had a hard time uh, for regulators and supervisors to understand the kind of initiative they were launching. They took two years to persuade them that this was a good initiative. Eh, la póliza también la consultamos con nuestros agricultores que son muy pequeños. Muchos de ellos no tienen tierra, pero son quienes producen los alimentos en mi país. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you say póliza. If there is someone around who can help me. Poliza is the insurance contract. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it gets easier. <laughs> he, she said that they also consulted uh, micro um, uh, farmers before launching the initiative, so. Mm. Okay, some of them are not even owners, uh, so that was also a challenge, but they consulted them around this uh, uh, poliza, polis. Uh, that they were launching. Eh, nosotros uh, estamos utilizando los datos de los satélites de la NASA para la, 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 el seguro paramétrico, pero además estamos contrastando con los datos generados por nuestra propia eh, eh, nuestra propia institución de medio ambiente que genera los datos sobre lluvia. Okay, they use uh, rain uh, rain data. And for this, they use their own database, but they also use NASA satellites 
to monitor the, the rain and, and all figures related with, uh, with the rain. En los últimos años mi país ha mejorado mucho la captación de datos de lluvia, pero no tenemos datos históricos. Entonces la póliza tuvo que, que utilizar los datos históricos de la NASA, pero los datos de, de nuestros clientes sí son nuestros, de las pérdidas que, nosotros, que nuestros clientes tienen año con año. Okay. They said uh, they used the NASA's, NASA satellite uh, because they didn't have historic records of a uh, rain disaster. So that's why they had to use the NASA uh, satellite. But they, they, them, they have the, the records, the historic records of the losses and defaults produced uh, by rain on their clients. Um, ha sido un proyecto con muchas dificultades en el camino, pero eh, Micro es un programa manejado por Suirre, y con Suirre hemos desarrollado la póliza. Eh, hemos colocado apenas más o menos 500 pólizas en el país, pero ya hicimos por lo menos unos 40 pagos. La 500 en este año? Sí, eh, empezamos apenas en julio de ah, este okay. año. En julio de este año iniciamos. Ya colocamos más de 500 pólizas, esperamos colocar 5,000 o 3, entre 3,000 y 5,000 en la prueba piloto. Uh -huh. uh, she says they have the support of Swiss Re for this uh, project. They launched it in July and they have already have uh, 500 subscriptions since July, but they expect to have 3,000, uh, between 3,000 and 4,000. Pólizas en seis meses que durará probablemente. Okay, in the next six months that is... Uh, the duration of their pilot uh, phase. La póliza tendría que haber sido lanzada al inicio de la época lluviosa en mi país, pero por los problemas de no entendimiento de los reguladores, lo lanzamos casi finalizando. No obstante, pudimos, eh, ya pagamos algunos, algunos, ya hicimos algunos pagos debido a que al final se dio un exceso de lluvia oh, okay. durante dos, 15 días. Oh, la época de, lluvia. En, de mayo a noviembre. Okay. Their idea was to launch this uh, pilot on, at, the, at the beginning of the rainy season, which is May, but they couldn't do it because of the problems of, uh, posed by the regulators and supervisors. So they just launched it at the end, but because the rainy season took longer than usual, they, it, it was still useful and they had these uh, subscriptions, and they had already paid 40 clients uh, thanks to the insurance for their losses due to the rainy season. Nos ha costado mucho que las personas comprendan qué es esto. Porque, como dije, la penetración es muy baja de seguros en mi país. Las personas sienten que es un gasto y no comprenden que están, que están protegiendo su, su inversión o su crédito. Para eso diseñamos un programa de valor agregado que incluye un juego en donde manejan riesgos a través, como un mono, monopoly, like a monopoly, eh, lo único que es pensado para manejar riesgos y ellos aprenden. Cuando ellos terminan de hacer el juego y nos demuestran que han aprendido, les damos una mochila de las 70 horas en donde tenemos eh, implementos básicos para la sobrevivencia en caso de desastre, lámparas, agua. Okay. Yes, they, they had a challenge in making... Um in commercializing this, this product because not everybody, I mean, it, the, as she said before, the insurance penetration is very low, it's just 6%. So people don't see insurance as a preventive measure or protective measure, but as a expense, uh, a cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, in order to promote this idea of insurance as a protective measure, they organized uh, a training session with, uh, with games, like a Monopoly. So they made people understand that, uh, well, they, because they, if you have the resources to protect yourself, you can face uh, difficulties easier. And at the end of the process, they gave them uh, a backpack mm -hmm. with a like, survival kit. Mm -hmm. eh, adicionalmente, <coughs> varios de nuestros, la mayoría de nuestros clientes tienen una instrucción educativa muy baja, menos de tres grados de escolaridad. Esto también fue di una dificultad a la hora de poder eh, contratar la póliza. No obstante, eh, nosotros creemos que vamos bien con la prueba piloto 
y esperamos el otro año cubrir a no, toda nuestra cartera productiva, que son cerca de 50.000 clientes. Uh -huh. An additional challenge, as you may understand, is that most of their potential clients are people with very low levels of education. So even subscribing the policy was a, was a challenge. But still, they, they, they hope that at the end of this uh, pilot phase, they could be able to cover uh, 50,000 of their clients. So if we, can we? I can understand. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's, it's uh, very hard to explain myself, but I understand <coughs> also. So that's fantastic. Um, Thank and, you. and maybe, could we ask our, our interpreter, introduce yourself, please? <laughs> uh, the new member of the panel, please. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Ines Garcia Pintos, and I am the CSR manager for Zika Bank, a Spanish bank, a Spanish uh, wholesale bank. Fantastic. I think this is a great example of resilience, being able to bounce back in the face of a shock. <laughs> and actually, that always requires spare capacity. So thank you so much for providing the, the, the caja no capacity. Problem, no problem. Um, please stay with us. You're now a member, fully full member of the panel. Thank you so much. So that was really heartening, and I think we'll come back in, in questions. So uh, Arif, uh, we're going from El Salvador to, to Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a great reputation for financial inclusion, uh, Muhammad Yunus and many other things, BRAC and, and so on. Wh where, where do we stand now in terms of the progress that's been made and particularly where, where do you and your organization fit into this, uh, this movement? Yeah, uh, let me just give you a background of the country that which is uh, for many people may not know. It's just uh, in between uh, India and China. We have got 160 million population and the country got liberated 47 years back. 160 million people. Last uh, 15 years, the GDP growth rate was more than 7%. Actually, now it's more than almost 8%. And uh, the country's GDP in PPP basis is around 750 billion US dollar. Per capita GDP is 4,600. But mind you, the number was, uh, was very, very low four decades ago. And out of 160 million people, now 130 million people has got telephone connections, teledensity rate is very high. 80 million people are in internet uh, 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 connected. Uh, around 65% of the population are less than 30 years of age. That is the youngest nation of the South Asia. And uh, uh, we are the second largest ready-made garment producer after China. Many of you may be wearing many shirts and trousers made in Bangladesh. Uh, we are exporting almost $30 billion a year, and 68% of that come to European Union. Uh, and uh, 4 million women are working in the industrial sector, and in agriculture, if you take the women's participation, it's the, one of the highest women participated economy in any part of the world. Um, uh, in terms of finance, and another important factor I, I think that would be relevant, that Bangladesh, although is, is it not uh, per capita income, is only very, very, uh, it's, it's just got graduated to developing economy, but Bangladesh has given 800,000 Rohingya people shelter this year when they were saved from the Myanmar army slaughter and rape. And that is, I think, a great gesture from Bangladesh community. Uh, in terms of financial inclusion, uh, uh, if we talk into the uh, total population who has bank account or a microcredit, you know that Bangladesh is the Makkah of microcredit. Uh, the BRAC, Grameen Bank, ASHA, many other microcredit institutions are there. Uh, so they have started a huge role in penetrating uh, uh, towards the rural people in the country. We have got formal banking sector, and very recently for the last uh, seven, eight years, what we are seeing that mobile financial service. So if we take all these three, and agent banking service recently, so if you take all these four together, uh, by a Bill and Melinda Foundation research report, they said that around 70% of the people of 160 million uh, have to s some extent either bank account or mobile money account or uh, microcredit account or to some extent registered. But so 75% a huge number if you take into Active user, they mentioned in the report, it's around 45%. So, and this number, well, a decade ago, was, was uh, maximum 20%. So in last one decade, with our government's uh, initiative, 
uh, uh, through digital economy. They are in, uh, empowering the entire digital building digital infrastructure and uh, central bank's initiative, especially the last uh, uh, immediate last governor, Mr. Atir Rahman. Uh, from 2009, he started lots of initiative with mobile financial service guideline, agent banking guideline, and uh, encouraging every rural citizen to open up bank. I think it's a revolution going on in the country. Uh, after MPES of Kenya, I think the Bikash, a black bank uh, uh, fintech company, who has just started seven, eight years back, now has 32 million uh, customers around the country, and many people are sending money and uh, borrowing. So I think uh, Bangladesh is a, is, a, is on the, on on really in, in a, on the go on this area. And our company, IDLC Finance, we are the largest non-bank finance company in the country. We are we, we are one of the top ten, top twenty listed company in in the country in terms of market cap. Our assets and assets under management would be around 1.35 billion US dollar. Around 43% of that are SME financing. So basically, we finance 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 25,000 dollar to many, many uh, uh, district level uh, and lower level people. Uh, we are also heavily engaged in women entrepreneurship loan, and recently we are emphasizing on more green financing. One of the important factor of our company is that in Bangladesh, the average non-performing loan ratio is 10%. But if you take the rescheduled or restructured loan. Uh, what we call extended NPL, which will be as high as 17%, very high, but IDLC has been maintaining it less than 3%. And actually, in last 33 years of our operation, actual loss is less than 1%. So this is one of the best record in the country, and we have been getting best award for the uh, best sustainability financial reporting in our country and the entire South Asian region. So that's, that's in a nutshell, uh, our uh, 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 status. But very recently, we are we are engaging with uh, uh, micro credit organizations, uh, joining hands together so that we can channelize our funds to the more and more number of people with our designated uh, uh, product design. So that's uh, so far about Bangladesh and uh, financial inclusion and our company. Well, that's fantastic, Arif. I think it'd be great to have some technology transfer about how you get MPLs, uh, real losses below 1% to some of the uh, Western banks. I think that'd be, a, a, be very good. Um, but I think you also mentioned a, a new area before, which I think is interesting, is looking at equity finance, because a lot of what we've been talking about so far has been credit and debt. But equity finance for SMEs sounds as a new departure. Sorry. Uh, Bangladesh equity market is around, market cap would be around uh, 40 billion US dollar. It's around 300 listed company. But if you take into the overall financial system, it is 90% capital originates from the banking system. So it's oh, heavily lending debt-based economy. Uh, I, I, before working here, coming here as a CEO, I worked as a regulator of the capital market, one of the board members of Bangladesh SEC. So I have seen five years from there that equity can really play a very important role in solving many of the society's problem. So uh, uh, taking that into consideration, we convinced our board uh, to set up our first venture financing uh, fund mm, by end of this year, maybe just, just uh, uh, December 3rd, 4th week, we'll, and that will be the first financial organization, bank, or entity who will start a venture financing formally. Because I believe uh, when you talk about financial inclusion, many of the young entrepreneurs who has bright, brilliant idea, they are completely excluded when you talk about the banking system because banking system always looks for what is your collateral. Uh, we don't finance based on cash, uh, cash flow basis. So I think that would be a great initiative from us to lead the market to uh, say that equity can be a new source of uh, financing and also can help financial inclusion. Fantastic, Arif. So, Sasha, um, yesterday uh, we had the launch of the Principles of Responsible Banking. Nordea has been one of the champions for this. Um, you're known for many activities uh, at, at Nordea, but where do you see financial inclusion playing a part in terms of your overall strategy for sustainable finance? Thanks, Mick, Nick, and great to be here. And this is a really, really a good example of, as you said, about the resilience. I think that the title of this uh, panel session should be Making Finance and Insurance Pick the Social Bill of Consequences of Climate Change, which is something that has not been addressed here. We talk about the impact, we talk about all of these good things that uh, various institutions, banks, investors, asset owners around the world are doing, and it, that's, that's really, really great. But if all of us here that participate in this conference are really doing what we're doing, then we should sort of uh, start wondering why is the world not in a better place than it is today. And I'm a bit puzzled with the fact that if we look at the uh, way how the um, 
financial institutions and the industry in general is treating the consequences of bad or short-term related financial decisions ending up in the social turmoil or um, issues that are related to um, people in many countries being able to survive. I'm, a, I'm a sort of a thinking about a couple of numbers which I think are quite telling when we talk about the social inclusion or insurance and finance inclusion. 2050, according to the UN, we will have 170 million climate refugees. Uh, we have seen some of these things in the Nordic countries, as you probably know. Sweden is one of the few countries in Europe that has taken influx of refugees from the tragedy in Syria. Uh, over the last years, we had 170,000 refugees that came in during the period of three months. Uh, the, the shock on the system in Sweden was not only related to the fact that these people needed a shelter, physical sort of a protection, but also how we as a, as a country and the financial institutions operating in this area could actually facilitate the integration and the way how we can include these people in the way how we run, or at least how we operate our countries. So um, one of the things that we as a financial biggest Nordic bank have done is that we are the only bank actually during this period that offered immigrants and the refugees, the, the limiting banking services. As you probably know, if you're not a refugee, I was a refugee once upon a time in my life. When you come to a country, you can't open an account. You do not exist if you don't have the right numbers and so on. So Nordea has actually been one of the banks in Nordics enabling refugees to open these limited banking accounts so that can actually take part in the society. We have also arranged the um, voluntary, uh, from, from the banking sort of a perspective, our own uh, banking institutions, we have about 30,000 employees. Each individual working for Nordea has ability to, to basically use two full working days as a vo in a voluntary way to support either refugees or support um, startups or support different activities that will contribute to societal sustainable development. We are also participating in a, in a range of regional activities on a school level, trying to educate and, and, and trying to get kids in the various programs to understand both importance of economy, but also in a way how the, um, the sustainability is part of how the financial system, but also economic system should be developed. Aside of that, we are forgetting a couple of things on the financial inclusion, which I think it's obvious for the Nordic and even the Western countries. I don't know if people are aware of that, but one third of everybody living in the Western world, and I think one third of everybody living in the Nordic countries in 20 years time will be over 65 years old. We have uh, artificial intelligence, we have a robotics, but in Sweden, being a very developed country, we have 900,000 people that need help to actually access financial services today and operate their lives in a, in a normal way. And uh, how that is done is that we, together with the different industry associations, are doing w whatever we can to offer them both education, but also offer them the way how they can actually tap into the, into the systems that we have and, and take part of that. Uh, on the sort of a social inclusion that is a more outside the realm of the bank, direct investments or, or lending uh, activities, I think it's fair to say that this is the area, and I still fi I find it very, very interesting, that is unexplored in these discussions from the angle of the consequences. I mean, the most of the consequences related to climate change being physical, transitional, uh, are related to people are related to people's ability to survive, move, um, invest, and, and develop themselves. So I'm, I'm a bit puzzled with the fact that this is not being discussed more from the angle of what industry is actually doing from, from that side. Uh, we are trying to do what we can. I think it's fair to say that our industry has not been that sort of a progressive, and I would say we are a bit late. Uh, we could all of us do uh, much more on the inclusion side. And I think we could all of us do much more to cooperate actually with the people working in the industry in the countries that will be affected by this. Uh, most of the consequences, and I think that's a fact in the world, uh, on the climate change, of the climate change, will be related to developing countries. I mean, the, the Fortune Europe will uh, pay itself out. Uh, but I think this is a very interesting sort of an angle because most of us are operating in a, f in a global world. We are investing globally, we are lending globally, but the effects of what we do are rather going to be significantly obvious uh, for the countries and people living in these countries. So I'm, I'm really, really interesting to discuss this. Thanks. 
No, I think that's, that's, that's very, very profound. I mean, one of the things I've noticed, actually, if you read the recommendations of the task force on climate-related financial disclosures, they're very, very uh, profound in terms of risk and so on. You'll find very few mentions of human beings in there in terms of the social dimension, in terms of either the workforce or communities, whatever. It's, it's, it's actually does not, the human is absent. But I, I think it's so fun. I've been in this industry for 15 years and it, we've been discussing the methodologies and techniques and all of these things. But very seldom on the conferences like this, there are people that will be affected by this in, the, in, in various parts of the world. And I think sort of a, that human, that part of ESS in the ESG should actually be more present in the way how we discuss what are the consequences of the, of the things and decisions that we're actually making. Well, I want to come back because I, I think we've got some very interesting themes, common themes. I'd like to come back. Um, before I do, Sony, uh, if you could fin finish the first round, um, lots of experience around the world. Where, where do you see the priorities now in terms of the inclusion agenda? Uh, let me start at a slightly unorthodox place. So Norway, as you know, is one of the richest countries in the world. The government did a comprehensive study recently on where does Norwegian wealth come from, right? So this is sort of the net present value of all future Norwegian wealth as can be best calculated. Uh, you know, it has a uh, sovereign wealth fund that's 300% of GDP, right? So that's huge. It has one of the best infrastructures in the world. It has still got a lot of oil in the ground, which sadly it still plans to drill as much as it harms the people that we are talking about. But what was remarkable about the study was that 75% of Norwegian wealth comes from human capital, right? And this is in one of the richest countries with fantastic financial savings, great infrastructure, and the contribution of those financial savings was just 12% of that physical infrastructure was just eight or nine percent and the oil in the ground was just two and a half percent, right? So this is human capital. Now, if you look at a country like Bangladesh, if you look at a country like India, if you look at most developing countries that haven't been so lucky in their endowment of natural resources, in their infrastructure, they are shoddy at best, right? Uh, the percentage of the potential wealth and prosperity of that country that comes from human capital is closer to 95% rather than 75. We are at the end of the day only talking about human capital and you know there is potentially one or two people in this room who can claim not to have benefited from the lottery of birth, right? I think everybody, most of the people faces I see, we have all benefited from the lottery of birth. Which one of us can look in the mirror and say someone equally intelligent, equally hardworking uh, is not out there tilling a farm with no prospects and hopes in their life just because they were born in the wrong place, right? And this is where the gap between delivering on that prosperity, on human capital, which is the one thing that human beings have in common, which is the one thing that has led to all the prosperity that we see around us. It's human creativity, ingenuity, and human capital. And it is our failure to develop that that is the single biggest crime against humanity. And climate change, as Sasha repeatedly pointed out, is exactly going to make delivering that even worse. Climate change is going to take away the potential for many of these unlucky people to ever, ever, ever meet their true potential and contribute as full members of society. And that is the biggest shock. And this is where both the access to finance aspect of financial inclusion as well as the insurance aspect are absolutely critical, right? I mean, there has been in history no climbing up the economic ladder, either for individuals or for industries or for countries, unless and until they have had access to the financial system. That's very clear precedent. That is an important component of climbing up the value chain. So that is an absolute minimum. And the failure, I mean, even though the discussion on the panel has primarily been about access to finance for individuals, the fact is there are multiple failings, right? I mean, we have $80 trillion of institutional capital that everybody keeps talking about. European institutional investors, less than 5% of their money is deployed in emerging and developing economies. And I'm including India and China here, right? And they already constitute 60% of world GDP. 
I mean, the asymmetry. So countries don't have access. Within countries, states and regions and cities don't have access. Rural areas in particular are underserved. And in, within those communities, the people who could most benefit from access to finance, the people who could most benefit from insurance are the ones who are most affected. So it's a multi-level problem that we need to address at each and every one of those levels. There's clearly proven evidence now, more and more research coming out, that you take two people and one of them is financially insecure. They fear that you know, if the next crop fails, what are they going to be doing? It actually has been proven in scientific experiments that it shrinks your thinking space, it lowers your IQ. It focus, it takes away from your ability to work and focus and be productive and focus on anything. Insurance is such an important part of taking away that insecurity and yet we have it at so many levels that people know that the next small disaster, whether there's a healthcare problem in the family, whether a rain, there's excess rain or too little rain, all of which is going to be made worse by climate change, means that they are unable to be the productive human beings they can be, even within the very limited opportunities that they have. So these are the essential nuts and bolts of basic development, of a minimum condition for meeting all of the other sustainable development goals, not to mention the very important goal of us being the best possible human beings we can be and delivering on the potential that all of us have, not just the ones who've won the lottery of birth. To conclude, I just want to use a couple of examples. So this is about 20 years or 19 years back. Uh, but I used to run a derivatives desk and I was asked to set up one of the first weather and cross commodity derivative trading desks in the world. And my condition for joining that was that the, they would allow me to do development related work. And we went to the IFC and I think the year must have been 2000 or 2001. And we got $10 million from the IFC and we had $70 million of capital from Munich Re and Swiss Re and some of the others. And we did the first weather risk management products for developing countries. We in helped insure farmers in Mexico, in South Africa. And our dream project back then was monsoon bonds. And what was interesting, and I'm going to conclude on this, is the link between the micro and the macro. So if you look today, one of the big problems in the financial system is there is this so-called risk on risk off. All the assets that traditionally used to be uncorrelated, when the crisis starts, they, all the correlations go to one. It's very hard to find diversification. And yet, the upside of many of these countries not being integrated in the financial system is that some of the truly, genuinely diversifying assets can be found, for example, in the catastrophe bonds in the CARICOM area, for example, in a monsoon bond, if it were ever issued, for example, in aggregating a lot of these micro insurance payments and facilities from across the world and putting it in a well diversified portfolio, there are ways we can connect the micro and the macro and that is the only way to go forward to actually enable the SDGs to be met, to actually enable human potential to be met. Thanks, Sony. Before we come to you, very good. No translation required, uh, fantastic. Um, I just wanted to pick up a theme which I think was coming across uh, the, the panel. Um, in one way or another, we've all been talking about uh, disruption, emergencies, refugees responding to, to crisis. Um, and, and it strikes me, I mean, it'd be interesting to see as if there is something here in the, the UNEP-FI context, we have the principles of responsible investment, the principles of sustainable insurance, and now we have the new baby, the principles of responsible banking. But it seems given the disruption, the turbulence that is being forced on people around the world, the Rohingya, the, the Syrian refugees, a crisis exacerbated by climate change, the emergencies, uh, Koswahida, you were talking about, and also Anna uh, in, in Central America. We know that, that they're very disrupted. W what could we do together on this to really address these, these very acute issues? These are, not, um, uh, these are no longer far away things which people can ignore, but what should banks, insurers, and so on, particularly in this context, you know, FI, what should we be doing together? The Koswahida? I think um, as the IDF, we recently signed on to the principles for sustainable insurance because I think that they provide a very good um, guiding framework for the work that we do across the five areas um, in terms of the companies. 
um, the public sector institutions that are engaged on these issues. Um, but as I mentioned, those five areas are really critical because it's about unlocking. It's also about addressing some of the structural issues that allow us or do not allow us to get to that second level, to scale up, et cetera. Um, so the point that I was making, for example, is if we talk about, okay, emerging economies, um, we need to understand that risk. There needs to be some kind of investment in the risk modeling side to understand what does that risk look like? How can we create products that are meaningful for people? Products that people can, that are accessible, right? But that also requires investment. On the regulatory front, how are we understanding the regulatory space within these countries, within these regions, to see how they can facilitate that? Um, but it's also about using the experience that I've had in terms of um, implementing these pools with public sector entities, is that they've actually opened up the appetite for governments to think about risk in a very proactive way. The fact that you can have a conversation around that at the end of it, you can tease out what does a drought mean to me in terms of impact on my economy? What does it mean in terms of impact on livelihoods? Is really important because you can start to quantify that. It also becomes, or it opens up a much larger conversation about the fact that insurance plays a very critical role, but there are significant gains that can also be made in investing in other risk reduction measures. I think sometimes we take it for granted that these conversations are taking place with the right um, constituents around the table to inform action. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion, but not necessarily discussion to inform action. Um, and that's where we need to go is, if we're looking at risk models, are we creating models that allow people to understand that can then be leveraged for innovative tools? Are we having right conversations with ministers of finance or technocrats within ministries of finance environment to converge the discussion around risk and helping them to identify within the budget if you have to pay for it? Where is that going to come from within the budget? That means dialogue with multilateral with international banks to say, can we find a way in which we can support some of these countries as they build their public policy systems and their public financial um, systems to take on some of these risks? Um, so I think that the PSI framework guides us in a very positive direction, but there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done to, to, to increase the urgency <laughs> within the various communities to collaborate, to align our efforts so that we are not doing one thing here, another there, and ultimately wasting time, right? And I think that platforms like this can play an important role in terms of catalyzing that kind of traction. Um, so those are my, my thoughts. It's about addressing structural issues, the commitment that it requires to engage and to take it to decision making and action and not just conversations. Discussion to inform action, very good. Anna Lillian, anything that you've heard so far which I think uh, uh, is relevant to your work um, in terms of the microinsurance pilot? Bueno, creo que los microseguros efectivamente es algo muy importante, pero yo coincido en que es necesario, es un programa multinivel y necesitamos hacer inclusión en varios aspectos. Por eso es que en nuestro banco nosotros hemos tratado de hacer varias inclusiones financieras. Okay, she's saying that she understands that microinsurance is very important, but the uh, the problem is multi-layer. That's why her bank has uh, decided to uh, introduce inclusion inclusion in different areas. Por ejemplo, nosotros somos el primer banco en mi país que utilizó el dinero electrónico y money. Mm -hmm. eh, también de pues, Estamos en la prueba piloto de los microseguros paramétricos y nosotros llevamos todas las transferencias que el gobierno da por los bonos de salud, de educación, pensión de adulto mayor. Eh, her bank was the first bank in El Salvador to introduce uh, electronic money. And it's also, well, apart from this microinsurance uh, pilot phase. No, they are the bank who, who channel the bank transfers that the government uh, delivers for uh, health insurance. Y también hemos diseñado algunos productos financieros como la cuenta para mujeres socias de grupos de ahorro comunitario y el, y la, y el crédito para estas mujeres. Okay. And they are also the bank who uh, coordinates the fund for Women, mujeres socias de grupo de ahorro comunitario. Yeah, they have a, a scheme by means of which women are partners in a joint savings scheme, and they are the bank who coordinates this uh, this scheme. 
Eh, por eso cuando alguien nos pregunta qué hacemos nosotros en términos de, de responsabilidad social empresarial, que es un término que se ocupa en mi país, y le decimos todos nuestros productos, uh -huh. toda nuestra cartera, uh -huh. es, tiene esta, este, esta, es, uh -huh. este tema. Yes, that's why when they ask them what do they do in corporate social responsibility, they say that the whole portfolio is uh, aligned with this uh, dimension. En mi país el sistema financiero es poco proclive a este tipo de actividades. Eh, nosotros somos un banco estatal pequeño, el 2% del sistema financiero, pero damos el 35% del crédito agropecuario y el 95% del crédito de granos básicos. This, she's saying that these uh, ideas are not uh, very much, uh, they are not very popular among the, fin the financial market there. They are a, a state-owned bank, small one. They only represent 2% of the market, but they uh, deliver 35% of uh, agriculture and farmer loans and 90. Yes. And 95% of loans related to grains. Eh, por eso es que también, solo una cosa más, por eso es que estamos queriendo lograr que nuestro sistema financiero firme un protocolo verde para poder hacer y jalar a los otros bancos privados grandes para que también trabajen en estas áreas que consideramos necesarias para nuestro país. That's why they, they I mean, they, what they want to do is to uh, promote this initiative among the financial actors and they want to take them on board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, now, I, I'm going to ask Arif a question, and then I want to ask all those people who are looking at their phones who, um, to actually think, because it's now going to be your turn to ask some questions. So, particularly, Arif, just wanted to pick up this theme, particularly of refugees. You mentioned about the Rohingya in your, in your case. Yeah. Thinking about Sasha and what actually Nordea has been doing in terms of actually enabling access. Has that been something in, in Bangladesh in terms of actually providing access to finance for those people displaced? Yeah, I, I think that uh, this is a humanitarian failure and a uh, and, uh, uh, lot of uh, international agencies are looking into it, our government is looking into it. But I would say that if you, uh, what Sasha and Sunny Kapoor mentioned, that if you take things in an isolated way, it will not solve the whole problem. It's an integrated world system and a lot of it are, comes from the political economy, political decision of the world's moguls of the politics. Some of them are now walking out of the climate uh, agreement. So that will have much deeper impact than this kind of discussion. But coming to that different level uh, in Bangladesh uh, or in other countries, what we can do, if you look into the global map, you will see that South Asia has 1.5 billion people, almost 25% of the entire world population. And uh, what Sasha was mentioning that Lots of climates, environment, uh, poverty-related issues, we are affected by uh, actions of the other parts of the world. And we are most vulnerable. And uh, Maldives, uh, Bangladesh, many of the countries are, uh, are on the verge of real uh, catastrophe, maybe in the next 50 years' time. Uh, uh, now, if you ask me how to solve this problem, we have to all work together and take the best practices in other countries and learn from each other and try to do it. But if you ask that how do we achieve SDG goal or everything together, I would say that it is all uh, boils down to the education of the people. Because uh, what, what Sunny was mentioning, that human capital, if that is 85% or 90% of the wealth creation, that the human capital is education. And once in Bangladesh, we give first mobile financial service to a rural woman who has first time in her life touched a mobile phone and there is no electricity, zero electricity, and she's telling that in one or two year time, I am now being able to manage my finance, getting education to my kid, and getting better healthcare understanding. So these are changing the social fabrics. Mind you, in Bangladesh, the average life expectancy was 52 years, 20 years back, it is now 72 years because of this groundbreaking initiatives. So this new generation of the people, if they get education, better healthcare and understanding, then I'm sure that human capital really in increases. No one actually helps in this world freely. I mean, no one will come and solve Bangladesh problem. We have to help ourselves first. And in the process, uh, we, we will discuss more and awareness creation and holistically we have to look into the whole uh, issues to solve the problem. That's my view. Great, I'm gonna to turn to you. We have a few minutes. Um, do we have a roving microphone? We have one there, so I can't see a thing, but if you could wave, um, then we can, ah, there we go. Uh, would anybody like to make a, a couple of uh, interventions before we wrap up? 
Are you all looking forward to lunch? Yeah? It's over there, fantastic. In the corner. <laughs> you had to be the furthest away, didn't you? <laughs> Please introduce yourself and uh, say your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nicolas Pio, CEO of Tilt Capital uh, Partner. Um, you've mentioned education, you've mentioned uh, the lottery of birth, really like that. Don't you think it's also high time we just uh, reconsider very bluntly our underlying assumptions on economic model? Every time we're talking about asset allocation, we're talking about a model which carves out externalities from the responsibility of the agents who are actually placing that, that, uh, that capital. And as, as so, so long as we do not tackle this issue frontally, how can we expect that we're actually going to make a systematic difference when every time we're going to invest, we're going to invest on a risk return allocation basis, which is actually a, a CAPM derived the, a portfolio theory derived theory, which means that we, we cannot, I mean, it's embedded in the system that externalities are to be managed by either NGOs or the state or external parties. Thank you. Always good to have the, the cap and model mentioned. Um, so, Sonia, are we going to solve with, with efficient markets? Uh, uh, our first point of hope is the so-called long-term universal investors who sadly are not doing their job. An example is the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. That is 1.1 trillion and is a 100-year investment horizon. For a fund like that, all externalities are actually internalities, right? I mean, if there is social unrest in the world, the fund can't thrive. What if one company doesn't pay its taxes, it takes away the level playing field from others. If you're using too many antibiotics in the food chain, that affects the quality of a lot of the other stocks that it has. So even within the constraints, I completely agree with you about the broader issue, but what I'm saying is even within the constraints that we have, particularly for those kinds of funds, they, even within the risk return considerations, they need to be a very significantly different asset allocation and different approach to externalities because there is nothing that is called an externality for a fund with that horizon, which considers itself a universal investor. Sadly, it doesn't behave anything like that yet. I, I, Sasha, I, I get the sense that you would like to jump in here. <laughs> yes, and, and I think your question was so good because Sony's answering more from the externality perspective, but what you're actually asking about is that the economic system, financial economic system that we thrive on, it's a pink elephant in the, all the conferences. Nobody's actually discussing how do we change that system. We are just changing the things around it, the way how we can approach or integrate things, but nobody actually talking about the underlying system that is built on the certain elements that are not changing. I mean, the expectation on growth, we talk about circular economy and all of these things. But that's fairly limited in the terms of the effect it has right now. So it doesn't work that way. Just give you a couple of numbers, which I think it's interesting. The number 100 is very interesting. The 100 people on this planet own more capital than 3.5 billion. The 100 corporates in this world emit 70% of all the emissions. And now we have built entire industry around this to explain how we're going to manage the carbon risk, how we're going to integrate these things. We know where these companies are. We know where they operate. Hundred of them. The names are published. Guardian has published the, the list of the companies. So why is it so complicated? Because it is in, in sort of, it's so integrated in a system that we just, ca we can't take it away because if we start doing that, then we are creating the social issues in various countries because we are not prepared to that. The people will be unemployed. There is a lot of fear on political unrest and things like that. But I think that's, that's extremely interesting from the point of economic system that is actually not reflecting what we really want to do. And that's the pink elephant in, in many of these conferences. We don't discuss the real issue. Thanks. Thank you. And <laughs> ah, we got from over here to over there. Question, please. Uh, please say your name. Thank you. Hi, Tatiana Bostils with Hermes Investment Management. Really interesting discussion. In the last two days, we've spoken about a lot about climate, and of course tomorrow is a climate finance day. Do you feel that the climate agenda has mature enough, and Nick uh, works a, a lot and has been promoting the notion of a, a just climate transition. How, how do you feel, how ready is the investment, the banking and the insurance uh, industry ready to tack on the natural capital aspect of climate change? 
because I feel that while we have warmed up to the notion that we need to, you, to look beyond mitigation or adaptation, there's still a certain challenge to, for example, justify to investor managers why we should be looking at stranded communities, why we should be looking at stranded workers, and especially how we're going to account of those elements which are probably even less um, easy to measure than, than the work. But has the industry mature enough? Are we ready to look at it? Should we be doing it today already? Arif, could I ask you? Are you how we link these two, two agendas, climate and the social, then Anna, I'll come to you. Yeah, it's, it's difficult for a financial institution's point of view that how we can really, we, we are talking all the climate change related agenda, but how can we really take part? We, we are just uh, looking into, uh, in a small segment, the green financing, less carbon emission, those uh, areas where we can contribute and we are doing that. But I think the uh, biggest part would be would be uh, not here. It's like I, I would go and agree totally 110% with Shasha is that it's like, these are like fixing the chairs in the Titanic when the Titanic uh, is sinking. The Titanic is the system and you cannot touch the system because it's, these are, these are very powerful I initiatives. So we can do it uh, from our financing area that we will look into all the areas where we can have more sustainable uh, c um, uh, environment friendly financing. We can have some impact, but the biggest, biggest impact needs to be coming from some other side. No sé si entendí bien, pero, <risa> eh, mi, por ejemplo, yo tengo clientes que han tenido pérdidas por cuatro años consecutivos. Ellos están en extrema pobreza, siguen, siguen cultivando solo para sobrevivir y estas pérdidas son a consecuencia del cambio climático. Nosotros les damos créditos, estamos tratando de protegerlos con los seguros, pero a mí me cuesta mucho encontrar un financiador para mi banco por el nivel de riesgo de la cartera. She's saying that she, they have a portfolio of farmers that have been running losses for the last uh, three, four years because of the consequences of climate change. And still they continue uh, working in their farms just to survive. And she continues to try to finance them and to sell them microinsurance, uh, but she has difficulties in justifying from a business pr perspective why she, is, uh, she can finance them because uh, the, the, the risk level of, their, of her portfolio is very, very high due to climate change. Akoswahi, last word from you. Um, what do we need? To I get a sense that, as uh, Sasha was saying, we're not taking this really seriously enough. There is a Titanic. Um, it's very urgent. Real people, real farmers are being hurt by this. What do we need to do now? I think within the insurance industry, you're seeing an emergence of um, community within that that is recognizing increasingly the urgency and wants to act as I mentioned earlier through the establishment of IDF yesterday we heard about um, some of the moves being made by AXA and others um, and as Denise said yesterday it's also by leadership and demonstrating successes <laughs> and that it can be done as well and I think that there is a lot of scope to actually share that message and to to exchange and say, okay, there, those who are leaders <laughs> um, to share as well how that can be done. Um, and we have seen examples. And so it's to give voice to what those examples are and to scale that up as well. So thanks very much. I, I, we've had a fantastic uh, panel. We've had one extra guest. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I end this session feeling very uncomfortable. I know we're not doing enough. Um, and I'd like you to join me again to th thank the panelists and now you can have lunch, but think about the farmers in El Salvador as you have the lunch. <laughs>